Hello and welcome back to another uh, lecture in our lecture series for this unit. My name is Matthew Belzer. I'm your instructor. As always, for every lecture we do, today we're going over the male reproductive system. I give you a set of learning objectives to help kind of guide you with respect to what's important or the important points to pull out of each lecture. I've also provided you with a lecture handout, so if I were you, I'd either print that out and take notes by hand as we uh, go through the lecture at each of the respective follow-alongs, or I would have it up on a computer and I would type your notes in because it'll kind of help you track with the lecture. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get going. Talking about male reproductive system today, and in order to talk about uh, the male reproductive system or the female reproductive system, I think it's important to de just define what sexual reproduction is. Sexual reproduction is the act of reproducing by combining the genetic material in the form of gametes from two previously existing members of the same species to produce a genetically mixed offspring. Male gametes, if you look here, are sperm. Female gametes are ovum or egg. When sperm and egg fuse in the process of fertilization, they produce a zygote, and through many rounds of cellular division, mitosis, that zygote grows into a baby and ultimately an adult. Why does sexual reproduction exist, and why do you find it in so many species? Well, sexual reproduction is a way to throw together potentially advantageous gene combinations. There is a saying in biology, nature favors genetic variation. So I'll give you an example of what I mean. I'm having a baby with my girlfriend, Jessica. I have great genes for cardiovascular health. She has great genes for immune health. We combine those genes and you produce an offspring who may inherit both of those traits from us. And now we've produced an offspring that has a higher likelihood of going on to survive and reproduce themselves. So in order to understand the first part of today's lecture, which is sexual differentiation, we need to review what a karyotype is. So in every one of your nucleated cells, you have 46 long strands of DNA. And these 46 long strands of DNA, 23 of them came from mom, 23 of them came from dad. They wrap around histone proteins to form chromatin. And when the cell is dividing, that chromatin condenses and you can see it as a chromosome. So what you're looking at here, a karyotype is just the picture of your chromosomes or a picture of somebody's chromosomes. We arbitrate, or any organism's chromosomes for that matter, we arbitrarily organize those chromosomes from largest to smallest, right? Now, chromosomes have corresponding genes, and when you get these chromosomes pairing up with these corresponding genes, we refer to it as being a homologous chromosome pair. A homologous chromosome pair will always have a chromosome from mom and a chromosome from dad. The first 22 pairs, or 44 chromosomes, are called autosomes. They have nothing to do with something called sexual differentiation. Sexual differentiation is the developmental process in which you form either biologically male or biologically female reproductive organs, right? And remember, we're not talking about gender expression. We're talking about the development of either biologically male or biologically female reproductive organs as it occurs in the overwhelming majority of humans, right? And other animal species for that matter. The final pair of chromosomes are what are called the sex chromosomes. We refer to them as the sex chromosomes because they play an important role in differentiating biological sex, meaning they play an important role in whether somebody will either develop male or female reproductive organs. So there are two potential combinations here. If, you're, <coughs> if somebody inherits an X and an X chromosome, in the overwhelming majority of cases, they will develop biologically female reproductive organs. If somebody inherits an X and a Y chromosome, in the overwhelming majority of cases, they will develop biologically male reproductive organs. So now that we've reviewed that, let's look at the life cycle of a mammal, specifically humans, because this is human anatomy and physiology. So we spend most of our life as adults, and you can kind of see the adults here. And adults consist of adult cells. 
Adult cells are things like mature liver cells, mature skin cells, mature neurons, and we refer to those adult cells as being 2N because there's a copy of the chromosome from mom, a copy of the chromosome from dad, so there's double the number of chromosomes, or there's one chromosome from each parent. When a cell has 46 chromosomes, we refer to that cell as being a diploid cell, right? And we denote it with 2N. Now, while most of your cells undergo the process of mitosis for things like growth and repair, in females, the cells in the ovaries, and in males, the cells in the testes undergo a process called meiosis. Meiosis in men is called spermatogenesis, and meiosis in women is called oogenesis. Now, when you think about this, meiosis is a process in which we take one cell and we produce four haploid daughter cells with half the number of chromosomes. In other words, we cut the no chromosome number in half. So after meiosis takes place in the testes, right, this sperm will have 23 chromosomes because we can't double up chromosomes every time we reproduce. And this egg or ovum will have 23 chromosomes. So we call these cells haploid because they have half the number of chromosomes and we denote it with N rather than 2N. So at some point in your life, you were a sperm and an egg floating around independently. And then that sperm fused with the egg through the process of fertilization. Those chromosomes combined, right? And the first cell you were was a zygote that then underwent mitosis many, many billions of time to form what you see in the mirror every day, a baby and then ultimately an adult. So that's the life cycle. When you think about the first step in sexual differentiation, the first step is fertilization. So sexual differentiation, step one, fertilization. Because it's during fertilization, you'll inherit either an X and an X chromosome or an X and a Y chromosome. By the way, you can only inherit the Y chromosome from the father. So it's at fertilization that you inherit either XX or XY chromosomes and therefore fertilization is step one in the process of sexual differentiation. Now, once fertilization happens, this zygote starts undergoing different rounds of division and for the first eight weeks, you're considered what's called an embryo or a developing human is considered an embryo. While you are an embryo, we have these things referred to during development as bipotential gonadal tissue. This bipotential gonadal tissue, right, can differentiate and it can form either male or female reproductive organs. Now the bipotential gonadal tissue will eventually form what's what are called the gonads. So bipotential gonadal tissue will form the gonads. The gonads in men are the testes, and the gonads in women are the ovaries. Now, on the Y chromosome, there is a gene, right? And that gene codes for a protein called testes determining factor. So it's called the SRY gene, and that gene codes for a protein called testes determining factor. If testes determining factor is present during embryonic development, this bipotential gonadal tissue will turn into testes. If you don't have a Y chromosome, just XX, there will be no testes determining factor in the absence of TDF or testes determining factor, that bipotential gonadal tissue will turn into ovaries. So step two is the differentiation of the gonads. Are we going to produce testes or are we going to produce ovaries? Because testes and ovaries develop from the same gonadal tissue, we refer to them as being homologs of one another. So the testes are homologous to the ovaries because they develop from the same tissue. Now step three in sexual uh, differentiation has to do with the differentiation of the internal reproductive organs. So the internal reproductive organs of men are the epididymis, the vas deferens, and the associated glands. The internal reproductive uh, organs of women are the vaginal canal, the uterus, and the fallopian tubes. If you develop testes, or if a developing embryo has testes, those testes will start to crank out testosterone. 
testosterone will trigger events in which you get the formation of male reproductive organs. The ovaries will not start cranking out testosterone. So in the absence of testosterone, this thing called the um, malarian duct will differentiate to form into the female internal reproductive organs. So chemicals essentially signaling molecules like testes determining factor in testosterone tell the body to develop male reproductive organs. In the absence of chemical signaling factors, the body's kind of automated revert switch is to de develop female reproductive organs. So step two is the develop is differentiation of the gonads. Will you develop will the developing embryo develop testes or ovaries? Step three is the differentiation of the internal genitalia, right? If testes develop, they'll produce testosterone, and that testosterone will trigger the events where you produce male internal reproductive organs. In the absence of testosterone, the body will automatically revert to the development of female reproductive organs. And the same trend holds for step four in sexual uh, differentiation, which is the differentiation of the external genitalia. So before anything happens, we have this tissue that can become either male or female reproductive organs. We have the genital tubercle, the urethral groove, and the labioscrotal swelling. In the presence of a certain type of testosterone, the genital tubercle will differentiate into a penis and the labioscrotal swelling will form a scrotum. In the absence of those chemical signaling factors, the genital tubercle will turn into a clitoris or differentiate into a clitoris and the labioscrotal swelling will form the labia minora and the labia majora and then the urethra fold will form the vaginal canal. So when I say the penis and the clitoris are homologs of one another, what I mean is that they develop from the same emb tissue embryologically. That tissue could go either way. When I say the labia and the scrotum are homologs of one another, I mean they develop from the same embryonic tissue. So those are the four steps. You have fertilization, differentiation of the gonads, differentiation of the internal genitalia, differentiation of the external genitalia. Now, it doesn't happen that way in everybody. There are genetic um, abnormalities that sometimes occur. So for example, Androgen and sensitivity syndrome is when during development, the receptors that would guide the development of male reproductive organs are not working properly. So androgens are things like testosterone. They're male hormones. So if testosterone doesn't have a receptor to bind to, the body gets confused and its automated revert switch is to produce fe female reproductive organs. So that condition is called androgen insensitivity syndrome, and what it produces is people who were born essentially biologically female with testi testes where the ovaries are, who, um, you know, for most of their life probably never knew that. And that became a big deal with an Olympic uh, runner, Castor Semenya, who um, had a huge legal ordeal, and it's just one of those kind of interesting conditions. So... Now we're going to go over male reproductive organs. The gonads of males, testes, gonads of females, ovaries, internal genitalia of males, the epididymis, the vas deferens, the seminal vesicle, the bulb urethral gland, and the prostate gland, females, the fallopian tube, uterus, vagina, and associated glands, external genitalia, penis and scrotum in males, and vulva is a blanket term for all of the external genitalia in females. So we're going to start with the support structures, right? Because the most important structure with respect to reproduction are the gonads, because the gonads are developing gametes, sperm in this case. So we need to support those gonads. We need to support the testes. And the way that the body does that is using a structure called the scrotum. Now externally, you can see the scrotal skin if you look at the scrotum externally, but if you were to strip away the scrotal skin, the scrotum is composed predominantly of two muscles. You have the cremaster muscle and the dartos muscle. And the job of the cremaster and the dartos muscle is to elevate or drop the testes. The reason that the testes exist outside of the body in the first place is that spermatogenesis, which is the process of sperm production, 
occurs more efficiently at a temperature that's two to three degrees below body temperature. Now, the functional role of the scrotum is really temperature regulation. That's its primary functional role. The scrotum regulates the temperature of the testes. And it does this in two ways. So if you were to be exposed to cold, or somebody was to be exposed to cold, pardon me, and they jump in like a cold swimming pool, that will elicit a set of contractions in which the cremaster and dartos muscle contract, pulling the testes closer to the body. On the flip token, if somebody is taking a hot shower, right, the cremaster and dartos muscle will relax, moving the testes further away from the body in an attempt to cool them. Now, the scrotal wraith corresponds with a structure called the scrotal septum, which separates the right and the left testy. You'd be very grateful for that, or anybody who's had testicular cancer that's been relegated to a single testicle is very grateful for that. Why are there two testes? Redundancy. If one gets destroyed, the other can pick up slack. Now, when you think about the testes, they're surrounded by a layer of dense connective tissue called the tunica albuginea, and Feeding into the testy is what's called the spermatic cord. The spermatic cord and the testy dis descend through the inguinal canal, right? And what the spermatic cord has is it has all of the blood vessels, the arteries and veins that feed into the testy, the lymphatic vessels that drain fluid out of the testy, the nerves that feed into the testy. The testy is well innervated, as I can attest to. And they have a duct that runs through them called the vas deferens that carries sperm from the testes to what's called the ejaculatory duct. So everything feeding into and out of the testes runs through the spermatic cord. And because of that, I'd be familiar with that structure, not only on this, but on the lab models, because I always ask about it. Now, the spermatic cord becomes clinically relevant in a condition called testicular torsion. And in testicular torsion, what happens is the testy gets hit in a weird way or it gets manipulated in a weird way and the spermatic cord twists up. If the spermatic cord twists up, it prevents blood flow, nervous system inputs, the drainage of lymphatic fluid, and that condition in which the spermatic cord gets twisted up is called testicular torsion. Testicular torsion is a true urological emergency, meaning that if you don't correct it, you will lose the testy. So if you went to the ER, for example, and you complained of acute onset testicular pain, or somebody goes to the ER and complains of that with swelling, they're going to be pipelined to the front because that testy only has about two hours before it is irreversibly gone. That's a big deal with kids where the connective tissue networks are not quite matured, so they have a higher likelihood of having that twist in their spermatic cord. How do they correct that? Well, they can correct it surgically, but a lot of times they just manually untoward it, right? So if it's twisted clockwise, you spin it counterclockwise and vice versa, but you need to do it. And you want to be careful of doing that on your own unless you absolutely have to, because if you don't know the direction it's twisted, you might just make things worse. Now, when we think about the testy, the scrotum surrounds the testy, and the testy is the gonad in males. Now, the testy is surrounded by a layer of dense connective tissue called the tunica albuginea and a serous membrane, essentially, called the tunica vaginalis. We're going to pay attention to the tunica albuginea, which has these invagnations, which separate the testy into a series of lobes. Within the testy, you have a series of tubes, or ducts, that play a very important role in reproduction, none more so than this one right here. The ducts in the testes where spermatogenesis occurs are called the seminiferous tubules. The ducts in the testes that make sperm where spermatogenesis occurs, and that's the only thing that makes reproduction possible, are called the seminiferous tubules. The ducts in the testes, the structure in the testes that makes sperm or where spermatogenesis occurs are called the seminiferous tubules. So if you look at the seminiferous tubules under a histological image, what you'll see is something like this. So here we have a tubule. This whole thing is a seminiferous tubule. Here's another seminiferous tubule. Here's another seminiferous tubule. And 
If you look at the production of sperm in the seminiferous tubules, sperm come out kind of tail first. So here we're looking at what are called sperm tails. Those are the flagella of sperm that allow them to swim. And they pop out, right, tail first with their head last, and then they get swept along with the current of the fluid in those ducts. These are not mature sperm yet, right, but they're getting there. They don't mature until they get to another structure that we're going to talk about in just a little bit. So these aren't cilia. These are sperm tails. Now, because sperm don't carry certain markers on their surface, the immune system would recognize them as being bad. So you don't want blood coming into contact with sperm, one, because you don't want an immunological reaction, and two, you don't want toxins and carcinogens getting into the cells used in reproduction because you don't want to pass on some nasty mutation. In order to protect, protect the developing sperm, we have what are called Sertoli cells. And Sertoli cells latch together with tight junctions and they form something called the blood testes barrier that protects this developing sperm. Now, in between the different seminiferous tubules, you have these cells called Leydig cells, aka interstitial cells. Running through them, you can see a blood vessel here, and Leydig cells are endocrine cells. And what Leydig cells do is they produce a hormone called testosterone. Testosterone is an androgen that plays a very important role in maintaining what are called secondary sex characteristics. It also plays an important role in spermatogenesis, but in this intro class, we're not going to go too deep into spermatogenesis. Just know it's the process of meiosis by which sperm is produced. So these Leydig cells produce testosterone, and that testosterone has receptors all over the place, influences muscle deposition, adipose deposition, the pitch and tone of your voice, where hair grows, etc. Now, when you think about the seminiferous tubules where sperm is being produced, you have these Sertoli cells, and they link together via tight junctions to form what's called the blood testes barrier, so you have that very defined layer of cells. And then you have the process of meiosis taking place that ultimately produces a sperm, and this sperm is going to get swept into a series of ducts where it's ultimately going to enter into the ejaculatory duct and into the urethra and be, um, through the process of ejaculated, be ejaculation be, um, you know, uh, uh, released by the body. Now, when you think about sperm, sperm has two regions. You have a head and a tail. The tail consists of a flagella. The flagella spins in a corkscrew fashion and it propels the sperm along. Sperm are the only flagellated cells in humans. You have a midpiece, and this midpiece has a ton of mitochondria because sperm require a lot of energy. They're swimming a very long distance proportionate to their size. <coughs> and sperm have a head. In the head of the sperm, we would have 23 chromosomes, not 46, but half that number, 23. So sperm would be considered haploid cells. And on the top of the sperm, you have an enzyme-filled sac called an acrosome. And the job of the acrosome is essentially to explode and to release um, proteolytic enzymes or enzymes that degrade the wall of the egg so the sperm can actually penetrate the egg because the egg has kind of a hard wall so you need to start breaking down that kind of hard external layer to the ovum or the egg in order to inject that genetic material. Now once sperm are produced, they enter into, they move from the seminiferous tubule to the straight tubule to the reet testy. I don't care that much about these. I do care about this structure that drapes over the posterior aspect of the testy. This structure that sperm eventually moves into that drapes, it's a worm-like structure that drapes over the posterior aspect of the testy. You can feel it. If you feel the testy, it's an important part of a testicular examination. This kind of worm-like structure that drapes over the posterior aspect aspect of the testy is called the epididymis. Now the job of the epididymis is to store and mature sperm. The job of the epididymis is to store and mature sperm. Sperm don't become reproductively viable until they spend a little bit of time in the epididymis. Sperm will then move from the epididymis to what's called the vas deferens, and the vas deferens is going to carry that sperm from the testy to the ejaculatory duct. So when you look at the epididymis, here's the histology of the epididymis, and what you're looking at is sperm, right? 
And these are sperm that are being stored and maturing. And then when you get sexually aroused, the smooth muscle lining the epididymis will start to contract to push those sperm further into the reproductive tract. Now, because imaging of the testes is difficult, you can't use x-rays, there's no MRI machine. One of the bread and butter procedures of many sonographers is actually doing testicular imaging. We do Doppler imaging to look at blood flow, but we always use a sonogram because that's not going to damage that delicate tissue and specifically your germ cells, your cells that are going to go on to produce like sperm and egg, sperm in this case. Now, a kind of wrap-up image of the entire reproductive system is right here. So, sperm moves through the ductus or vas deferens all the way to this duct right here called the ejaculatory duct. This is where sperm starts to mix with glandular secretion. The overwhelming majority of semen that's ejaculated, right, is not sperm. 1% or less of semen is sperm. Most semen, the stuff that gets ejaculated during orgasm, is not sperm. It's secretions from glands. So about 60 to 70 percent of the glandular secretion, right, that makes up semen comes from these glands that sit on the posterior aspect of the urinary bladder, and I'd watch that lab review video to look at these, but they're called the seminal vesicles. And the job of the seminal vesicles is to produce a very fructose-rich, so sugar-rich, alkaline solution. Sugar rich to provide energy to the uh, sperm because there's those those sperm require have a lot of mitochondria they require a lot of energy to get where they're going. Alkaline to buffer the acidic environment of the vaginal canal, which is not very friendly to sperm. So then. Right, that sperm mixes with another set of secretions, glandular secretions that come from the prostate glands. The prostate gland produces anywhere from 20 to 25 percent of semen, and it produces a milky white alkaline solution called prosthetic secretion. That milky white alkaline so, so, uh, secretion also, right, um, buffers out the acidic uh, pH of the vaginal canal. And it's also responsible for preventing sperm from clumping, but we're not going to get into that pathway in this class. So you have the prostate gland. Then you have what's called the bulb urethral or the cowper's gland. This tiny little gland at the base of the penis, which extends into the pelvic cavity quite a bit, more than you probably think. The job of this is to produce a slick alkaline solution that eases the movement of sperm through the urethra right? And also buffers the pH in the urethra itself. It's often just due to its proximity, the first secretion that we see, we often refer to this secretion as being pre-cum. So it's a really slick alkaline secretion. Now pre-cum can have sperm in it. Trust me, you don't want to work on that as your birth control mechanism. So sperm will move, right? From the vas deferens to the ejaculatory duct through the prosthetic urethra, membranous urethra, spongy urethra, and they will be um, ejaculated out into, if it's the act of reproduction, into a female reproductive tract, right? Or wherever. I don't judge. I don't care. Now, the structure that actually facilitates ejaculation and plays an important role in the orgasm portion of sexual reproduction, it's essentially a semen delivery device, is the penis. The penis is just a set of spongy tissue, right? It's a blood sponge. So it has a ton of blood vessels running through it, and it's just a sponge for blood. The large sponge that forms most of the girth of the penis is the corpus cavernosum. And the smaller spongy area through which the urethra runs is called the corpus spongiosum. Now, when you look at the penis in a cross section here, what you see is the corpora cavernosa, aka a corpus cavernosum. And running through the corpus cavernosum are the central arteries or the central penile arteries. And when sexual arousal happens, these arteries 
dilate, bringing in more blood to the penis, and that increased blood flow to the penis perfuses through this spongy tissue, and it causes it to build up what's called turgor pressure, and that turgor pressure is what we think of as an erect penis. Then we have the spongy, corpus spongiosum, and the corpus spongiosum is the area through which the urethra runs. It also engorges with blood during sexual arousal. When you look at this, right, but it doesn't develop nearly as much trigger pressure as these guys do. When you look at the penis, I think it looks kind of like a smiley face. So there are the two eyes and then the corpus uh, cavernosum, and then here's the mouth with the urethra. And that's it for today. Thanks, guys. Have a great day.